Okay, welcome back to 2S, the Horror Quarters podcast. Today's episode will be covering the assassination of John F. Kennedy, which occurred on November 22nd of 1963. Um, There's a little bit of history for me in regards to that case. Um, In back in 92, which was my senior year of high school, I had to do a term paper on a subject and I didn't know what to do it on. And I, I remember the teacher reading off a list and one of the choices was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I chose that one because that was just the one, like the last one I heard him say. And I just wanted to get the term paper over with. Well, that created somewhat of a monster in me in regards to true crime. That was my first true crime or American crime story that I became extremely engulfed in and obsessed with um, that year. And coincidentally, one of my elective classes, I worked in the school library. So, And John F. Kennedy's assassination was one of the subjects that had quite a few books in that library that I was able to go over while I was there and also able to check out, take home and study. And, you know, it became, like I said, somewhat of an obsession and um, I'm trying to show my friends the books and they just want to hang out. You know, it's our senior year in high school and I'm, I'm bringing these books with me to try to show them like, hey, check this out. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And the majority of the books back then were conspiracy books, conspiracy theory related books in regards to the assassination. Um, I even wrote a small paragraph that made it into the newspaper, the local newspaper at the time basically said I believe the headshot came from the grassy knoll. So, I mean, we'll get into all of that. I know there are countless theories. I'm not going to push any theory upon anyone. So fast forward to 1994. My Uncle Gerald, who I used to call Theo Turkey, he was working in Dallas. He was a consultant for some of the banks out there. And he flew me out there that year, and I was able to spend a couple of days checking out Dealey Plaza. I took a little tour out there. It wasn't that in-depth of a trip as far as what I could take photos of. But anyways, it was still a very good trip for me to actually see things that I've only read about. And Teal Turkey, who has since passed away, is the reason I named this podcast 2S. He passed away in 2018, and when we went to New York to clean out his apartment, in Queens, I had just started this podcast, but I didn't have a name for it. So I was struggling to find a name for it. And I knew that something like that would have to come to me. So as we're cleaning his apartment, I'm taking a break in the hallway there and I'm leaned up against the wall right across from his door to his apartment. And I'm looking right at his door buzzer and around the peephole is the label for his apartment number, which was 2S. So what you see on the logo is 2S, and that is his actual door buzzer. The eyeball inside of the slider there is actually my son's eye mixed in with some type of zombie or something like that. So over the years, as I moved on from the JFK assassination, I started to study other true crime cases, some that I've covered on this very podcast. So we come to 2013, which was the 50-year anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Myself and a friend flew back to Dallas to be there for that, to see what that was like 50 years later. And that was extremely interesting because that time I got to go up to the sixth floor into the museum and see what that was like and, and had a much more solid understanding of the events during that time. But one of the drawbacks for the 2013 visit was I didn't really run video. I took a bunch of still photos. But at the time, I didn't know I was going to be doing this. So we had to go back. And we just came back a couple of days ago. Myself, my co-producer, Ralpha, and Jose. We went and covered a lot of things. Took a lot of video. So you'll be seeing that in this episode. On the morning of November 22, 1963, 
John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie were staying at the Hotel Texas. And it was outside of the Hotel Texas that he gave a speech to a large crowd. Here is the Hilton Fort Worth. And back then it was called the Hotel Texas. But this is located at 815 Main Street in Fort Worth. And this building here is where his final speech was given inside of the Crystal Ballroom over breakfast. He did give a speech outside in the light rain to a crowd. And if anyone doesn't know, this kid here, this eight-year-old boy on the shoulders of his dad, is the late actor Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton, of course, starred in Aliens, Titanic. He executive produced Parkland. Here is the dedication to John F. Kennedy and his speech outside. This is the general area that he gave the speech. I don't know that it's the exact area based on the logistics of what it looks like now. But here is a, a bronze statue and it's a beautiful, beautiful statue. The president and Jackie stayed on the eighth floor, which was then room 850. I've read that room 808 is the only part left of that room, but I've also read that rooms 806, 808, and 810 were part of that room. And from there, the motorcade went from Love Field into Dallas and into Dealey Plaza. From Hotel Texas to Carswell Air Force Base, it shows it at 7.2 miles away. But if you take the routes and, and the roads and stuff, it's about 10 miles. So here's an overview of the distance from Carswell Air Force Base to Love Field. And it shows it at about 35 miles away. So heading west on Main Street, the motorcade makes a right onto Houston heading north, heading towards the Texas School Book Depository, where it then makes a slow left around that curve onto Elm Street. And somewhere just past the street light would be where the first shot was fired. And then as President Kennedy emerges from behind the Stemmons Freeway sign, he's clearly clutching his throat. He's been hit. And of course, pretty much lined up to where Mr. Zapruder was filming, the headshot landed, jolting the president's head back into the left. The Warren Commission came up what was called the single bullet theory or the magic bullet theory, where one bullet was responsible for seven wounds. And the bullet itself, allegedly found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital, has been described as pristine. I think if you look a little deeper into it, it does have a little bit of damage to it, but it definitely, in my uneducated opinion regarding firearms and bullets, it's, it's not what I would have expected on a bullet causing seven wounds. And the seven wounds being entering the back of President Kennedy's neck, exiting the front of his neck, entering Governor Connolly's back, shattering one of his ribs, exiting Governor Connolly's chest, striking Governor Connolly's right wrist, and then embedding into Governor Connolly's left thigh. We couldn't put our drone up when we went last month because it was just way too windy. I started scouring the internet, reaching out to people, and Justin was kind enough to respond. Justin, I appreciate you coming through for me here. Um, anyone that needs any kind of drone photography, please visit Wonder Drone Photography and reach out to Justin. Thanks again, Justin. So here we are 
up high over Dealey Plaza. And you can see here, there's Main Street. And then if you make the right onto Houston, you'll approach the Texas School Book Depository, make that left onto Elm and head down Elm. And right about here and here is where we know shots landed. And right about here is where the headshot hit. And after the shots, this here is where the president's motorcade sped through the triple underpass and headed to Parkland. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. The president's body was then taken to Love Field Airport and placed upon Air Force One, where then Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as new president. I saw the president grab at his throat and he moved to his left violently and I knew something was wrong. And so I jumped from the follow-up car, ran toward the presidential vehicle with the idea of getting on top of the rear of the car to form a protective barrier behind President and Mrs. Kennedy to prevent any further damage from being done. As I got close to the car, a third shot was fired and it hit the president in the head. It entered the rear of the president's head and it exited the upper right quadrant of the skull. And blood and brain matter and bone fragments came out of the wound, came over the back of the car, over Mrs. Kennedy and on myself. While I was doing that, Mrs. Kennedy came out in the trunk. She was trying to grab some of the material that came off the president's head. So she, she's right up on the back of the car. And she didn't know I was there. And I finally got up there and I got a hold of her and put her in the back seat. And when I did that, the president's body fell off to its left into her lap. His head was on her lap and the right side of his face was up. I could see his eyes were fixed and I considered it a fatal wound. Here we are back at Dealey Plaza on the ground. Footage shot by Jose Gomez for positive negative photography. George Dealey was a Dallas, Texas businessman and he was a longtime publisher of the Dallas Morning News and owner of the A.H. Bellow Corporation. The plaza was named in his honor in 1934. And of course, the plaza has gained notoriety in my opinion, this is the most infamous crime scene in American history. Even more famous and prominent than the O.J. Simpson case, the Patty Hearst case, and several other cases. But to me, this is the king of crime scenes for a couple of reasons. The first reason would be we've all seen the Zapruder film. So the crime itself has been documented. And the second reason that it is so prominent and the king of all crime scenes is that it has all been preserved to relatively close to how it looked back then in 1963. And on top of that, it is accessible to the public. Here, Jose is standing on the Zapruder pillar where Abraham Zapruder shot the infamous 8 millimeter footage of the assassination. There's some trees overgrown here, so we couldn't get the exact level, but it's close. So as you can see from where Jose is standing and shooting this, Abraham was really close to the shooting. And he kept the fortitude up to keep rolling to catch the headshot amidst all the chaos. Here we are behind the wooden fence 
up on the grassy knoll where a lot of people think the headshot came from. And while you're back here, you can see how hidden it is, yet it's extremely close and it's almost a perfect shot if that's where the shot was taken. And of course, there were several witnesses pointing up to the grassy knoll right after the shots. And a lot of people started running up that knoll thinking some of the shots were coming from there. Now it's to be noted that Dealey Plaza has been described by some as comparable to a canyon where sound can bounce around and travel around and sound like it's coming from one spot when it's coming from another spot. Just because of the way the buildings enclose the area and the gaps in the buildings as well. After 11 or 11.30, there was practically no movement in the area whatsoever. Uh, however, about uh, 12.10, give or take five minutes, there was a car which entered the area and probed around for some time. Uh, this car was a 59 Oldsmobile station wagon with a out-of-state uh, license. It uh, was muddy as if it had just come in off of the road from some area where it was... Uh, red sandy area. Uh, it uh, was occupied by one male who spent uh, three or four minutes in the area uh, looking it over and then, uh, as he found out, left by the entrance, which is the only way in and out of the area at that time. Uh, not uh, too long after that, perhaps uh, five or six minutes, a car of a totally different description also occupied by one male entered the area. Now this man uh, performed a similar action and he toured down around the area probing to examine the exit and uh, seeing that uh, one or more occasions to have a mic or something resembling uh, such an instrument up to his face. Just a few moments after that um, the third car uh, came into the area, and these were the only three cars that uh, entered this area during this uh, specific period. The third car was a 61 or 2 Chevrolet. Uh, this car was uh, muddy all the way up to the windows as if it had just come in off the road. It had an out-of-state license, of the, identical to the first car of the series. And it also had political stickers on it, which were not only for the same uh, candidate, but were identical in nature and color, uh, so that they appeared to have been from the same group. This also, this car was occupied by uh, one male uh, who spent a little bit more time in the area than the others and uh, probed down by the side of the tower where I was located. Uh, I could not state that these cars left the area entirely because after they got back onto the extension of Elm Street in front of the school depository building, they were lost to my vision so that uh, they could have remained uh, very close by. Immediately after the shots were fired, uh, of course, was uh, mass confusion, to put it mildly, uh, but the area was immediately sealed off by uh, I would say at least 50 police within three to five minutes. Uh, at the time of the shooting, uh, in the vicinity of where the two men I've described were, there was a flash of light, or an, there was something which occurred which caught my eye in this immediate area on the embankment. Now what this was, I could not state at that time, and at this time I could not uh, 
identified other than there was some unusual occurrence, a flash of light or smoke or, or something, uh, which uh, caused me to feel like something out of the ordinary had occurred there. And the front of us coming towards us, and we heard the first shot, and the president, I don't know who was hit first, but the president jumped up in his seat. And then as the car got directly in front of us, well, a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the president inside the side of the temple. Did, did you, do you think the first gunshot came uh, from behind you, too? I, I think it came from the same location. Uh, uh, apparently back up on the, the uh, uh, mall, I don't know what you call it. You should think the shot came from up on top of the viaduct toward the president, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, not, no, not on the viaduct itself, but up on top of the hill, oh, a little yeah, mound yeah. Of, of ground near the garden. Oh, I, I thought it was a firecracker, and I saw the blood, and I I had the baby, and I, I just ran, and we, I got on top of him and laid on the grass. He kind of raised up in his seat, and uh, I thought, you know, he was kind of going along with a gag or something. We are down here at the triple underpass where a bystander by the name of James Tague was hit by fragments of one of the bullets, which, logically speaking, would account for one shot. James Tague was standing right about in this area where he was struck. And if you believe that James Tague was hit by fragments of one of the bullets, then that leaves you with two bullets left. Well, that, okay, that furthest street over is a one way going that way. And I was in this lane closest to us, right over there. That car just popped, those cars just came through. And you come over to that first column between the streets, I was standing right out from it. Right. But my car was still parked underneath the truck water pass. You turn around, one down, and the last one over is a six floor window. And he looked up at me and he says, You got blood on your face. And I reached up and I remembered that something had stung me during the shooting. Right here we're walking north on Houston and looking at what was then the Texas School Book Depository. And at the sixth floor window there they have a display up but that was the window that Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly fired the three shots from. There are so many theories out there it's just a matter of what you believe in but that is the sixth floor window there and that is where Lee Harvey Oswald was employed at the time. We were able to catch this tour guide here. Shout out to you, whoever you are. But he made the left from Houston onto Elm into that center lane in somewhat of a replica of the vehicle that the president was in. And you can see him heading down Elm Street there. Approaching the first X on the street where the first shot entered the back of John F. Kennedy's neck. One of the key witnesses that, by choice, stayed out of the limelight was a 15-year-old kid by the name of Amos Ewings. Amos was standing at a pillar right across the street from the Texas School Book Depository, so he had an upfront and close view of the president's limousine making that left onto Elm, and he was pretty much lined up with the sixth floor window at the Texas School Book Depository. And he was at a prime spot here, because just in front of him, looking up six stories, was the sixth floor window that Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly fired the shots from. And according to Amos, he saw a rifle 
from that window and a man there and he pointed the officers in his area to the depository and that's where they went up and searched to see what was going on where they found the rifle the shells so forth If you haven't been to the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, I definitely recommend it. The floor now is a museum um, filled with different pieces of information on the walls, different facts about the case and, and photos. Very interesting. There are two sections of the floor that are glassed off. And one is Oswald's alleged perch, the sixth floor window you can see pretty much how he had it. I don't think it's original boxes or anything like that, but it's original flooring, original walls. And with that, you can get an idea of how it looked that day. On the other side of the building, in the other corner, is where they found the rifle and a clipboard. That is also glassed off. You can see a couple of freight elevators that look as they did back then, which is another interesting aspect of the building. You can take photos there, but not flash photography, and you cannot take any video. But you can go to the seventh floor and go right over the sixth floor perch and stand directly over the sixth floor sniper's nest and get some pictures outside of that window. And you can see how far it is, the distance it is down into the grassy knoll. And you can see where the X's are marked in the street there, what the shooter would have seen. This is Lee Harvey Oswald's wedding ring that he left in a cup on the dresser at Marina's bedside on the morning of November 22, 1963. This is the letter Z from the famous Hurt sign that was on the roof of the Texas School Book Depository. This is very interesting here. This is the hat that Jack Ruby wore when he gunned down Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement there. This is the tan suit worn by Detective James Lavelle, who was escorting Lee Harvey Oswald from police headquarters to the county jail. This model was built so that investigators could get a better visual on the grounds of Dealey Plaza and the potential trajectory of the bullets. I do want to say, um, one of the museum curators there, Stephen Fagan, I talked to him in 2013 and he told me in regards to the Zapruder film, I asked him, what do you think about the Zapruder film? And he said one thing about the Zapruder film is that it'll tell you whatever you want it to tell you. And he's right, depending on what you believe, the Zapruder film will somehow back it up. Now, less than an hour earlier, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested at a Texas movie theater on Jefferson Street. On Sunday morning, November 24th, Lee Harvey Oswald was shot and killed on live television by Jack Ruby. Oswald himself then died two hours later at Parkland Hospital.
here we are at the Texas Theater, which has been renovated over the years. And as you can see, it's kept up pretty well. The outdoor box office is the box office that Oswald walked right past and through this area here of these two doors. I'm sure these aren't the original doors, but it was on the right side here that Oswald walked into. Now the box office is on the inside. Shout out to the Scream franchise as well. We weren't able to get into the interior of the theater, so I want to thank Dan Restadon, Object History, and that Don Lewis for the use of their footage of the inside of the theater. Oswald's actual seat is long gone, but this is where it would be right here. Third row down, fifth seat over. Here is where Lee Harvey Oswald is buried. It's the Shannon Rose Hill Funeral Chapel and Cemetery in Fort Worth. And next to Oswald's grave is kind of another famous grave. I don't know the real story on it. I heard a couple of things here and there, but Nick Beef. We also went to visit 214 Neely Street, which the structure is still there. It's vacant, but it's still there. According to one of the neighbors there who was extremely friendly to us and helpful, he just recommended that we take as many pictures as we can because they are going to tear it down. This is the location that Oswald took the famous photo where he's holding the rifle in one hand and the paper in the other. And it pretty much still looks the same. There's another theory that was presented in 2011. A man by the name of Max Holland and his team of investigators named it the Lost Bullet. And what Max Holland is saying is that the first bullet hit the streetlight just above the limousine as it crossed onto Elm Street. Max Holland and his team came across the Secret Service training film, which was shot on November 27th, five days after the assassination. And it looks to me like a recreation of what happened. And what he found on this footage was on one side of this traffic light, you can see a white blemish, probably a hole or some kind of marking on the street light. And if you were to go to the other side of that street light, that white indentation or mark matches up. This shows evidence of the first shot deflecting off of that light missing the president altogether where it traveled down the street and eventually hit a curb which eventually injured James Tagg. And to piggyback on that theory, Max Holland covers this moment of the Zapruder film which I find interesting because don't just look at the president or Governor Connolly or the president's vehicle. Look around and you can try to get a gauge on what the people around we're reacting to. This Secret Service agent here is George Hickey. And George Hickey's statement reads as follows. After a short distance, I heard a loud report, which sounded like a firecracker. It seemed to come from the rear right, which seemed to me to be on the ground. I stood up 
and looked to my right and back, trying to recognize it. Apart from people yelling and cheering, nothing caught my attention. And you can see him here, clearly turning to his left, crouching down, looking to the ground. This is him here. And you can see the president still waving. This is consistent with the theory that the first shot missed and hit that traffic light where it eventually diverted down the street, struck the curb, and from the residue of that wounded James Tegg. Now this video was taken by Robert Hughes. He catches the president heading north on Houston, making the left onto Elm. And on the Lost Bullet documentary, they really zoom in on the sixth floor window as the president's limo makes the left. As you can see here, the president making the left, we have a nice shot of the sixth floor window, the grainy, but it still shows the sixth floor window. Now, as we zoom in here, Max Holland claims you can see movement in that window, and that movement is Lee Harvey Oswald making his adjustments to fire off the three shots. Look closely, I see some kind of movement in that window in what appears to be a white t-shirt or a light colored t-shirt. At approximately 1.14 p.m., Officer J.D. Tippett stopped Lee Harvey Oswald, who was on foot near the intersection of 10th Street and Patton. As he got out of his vehicle, Lee Harvey Oswald shot him four times and fled on foot to a local movie theater on Jefferson Boulevard. According to witnesses, as Officer Tippett exited his vehicle to approach Lee Harvey Oswald, Oswald pulled out his revolver and shot him three times until he fell, and as Officer Tippett lay there, he was then shot a fourth time in the head, killing him. Going to the intersection where Officer J.D. Tippett was murdered was also an experience that was pretty memorable because that's another tragic story. Uh, Officer Tippett, according to his wife Marie, came home that day and surprised her and her son and had lunch with them and then said he had to get back out there because, you know, the president's in town. And Officer Tippett, as he approached Oswald, of course, was shot and killed right there in the street. There's an X there that shows the location where that happened. And when you're there, you really feel, you really feel the sorrow. To me, that was the one location where it really hit home. I think because, I think because we already have so much information in regards to JFK being assassinated with Dealey Plaza and the sixth floor autopsy photos the Sapruder film and all that so we have a, a familiarity of that in my opinion the murder of officer jd tippett we're not that intimate with um we're not that familiar with we're not that close to as we are in relation to other things about the case we've all seen jack ruby shooting oswald on tv we've all seen the Sapruder film but there is no video of officer tippett being gunned down all there is is just a lonely intersection there was someone there that helped us out talk to us that lived near there a guy by the name of Jose so I want to thank you for giving us a little bit more information in regards to what happened he gave us the way Oswald came in and showed us and pointed us to how far it was from that house to Jefferson where the movie theater was so thank you Jose for that here's an aerial shot of the distance between the Tippett location to the movie theater on Jefferson Boulevard and it's 0.63 miles. And here we are at 1026 North Beckley Avenue in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. And it is ran by a Patricia Puckett Hall, or as she says, to call her Pat. We went in there and we took the tour. Pat was incredibly hospitable. 
answered any questions that we had. This is where Lee Harvey Oswald stayed and rented that small room with the small bed that is still there. It's the original frame, but the mattress has since been disposed of. But Pat gave some history on the place, and I believe there were 18 rooms were rented out to various people at the time. But her memories of Lee, though she didn't live there, the place was ran by Pat's grandmother. Pat would be there with her brothers. And she's got stories about how kind and friendly Lee was, especially with the children helping out. There was a story that Pat told her two brothers were fighting in the front yard, and by the time Pat got outside, Lee Harvey Oswald had the two boys separated and sorting out the situation and kind of making good on the fight. This trip was full of great and surreal experiences in regards to this case. And going to the Ruth Payne house where Marina and the kids lived was another highlight. The Ruth Payne House is located at 2515 West 5th Street in Irving, and it is well preserved. It's an operational museum now at this point that has certain hours during the week and times because it is a neighborhood. The front yard here is where Ruth Payne talked about on that Thursday she came home from grocery shopping and she saw Lee outside with the kids playing, and she thought in her mind, well, what's he doing here? He's usually here on Fridays. So that was a little weird to her, but uh, Lee helped her in with the groceries and ended up spending the night that Thursday night and leaving Friday morning with Mr. Frazier. So when we got there, it was just myself, Rafa, and Jose, and one person who was there running the place. And we pretty much had free reign in the house. According to our tour guide, there were two pieces of furniture that were originally in the home and I believe it was this lamp and this speaker that were donated by Ruth's husband Michael but it is an incredible place to visit and see because this is the house that Marina was staying at she was split up with Lee but they were still trying to work it out so Lee would usually come here during that time on Fridays and then go back out to work on Monday to the Texas School Book Depository. Here is the garage, and this carpet here represents the carpet that Oswald hid his rifle in. He had it rolled up and tucked away in the garage somewhere in this area. Now heading down the street here to the corner lived Lenny Mae Randall. Now Lenny's brother, Wesley Buell Frazier, was staying with her at the time and was also a co-worker of Lee Harvey Oswald's at the School Book Depository. On the morning of November 22nd, 1963, Lenny said that she looked out the window here, I'm guessing it's this window here, and she saw Lee walking towards the house with a box in his hands that was about two and a half feet tall, in which Lee said that they were curtain rods. Lee puts the curtain rods into the back of Mr. Frazier's vehicle and uh, the two of them head to the Texas School Book Depository. And as you can see here, it's a short walk from the Ruth Payne house to where Wesley Frazier was living, 250 feet. I was able to visit John F. Kennedy's Eternal Flame at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, but I wasn't able to get any kind of video that I wanted because there was probably 60 people, maybe even more, surrounding it. 
but I will include photos of it, photos that I was able to get. I had a neighbor back then um, who was around when the assassination occurred, so he saved some of these publications and newspapers and things and gave them to me. Here's just a few of them. This one here is interesting. He framed it. It's some type of error that was made, which states assassinate Kennedy. But he framed it, and he was nice enough to give me all of this stuff because he saw I was studying it at the time. So shout out to Wally. This was my third trip out there, but it was definitely a necessity to bring Rafa and Jose out there to get this footage so I can present it to you and you can see it more in real time. So I'm glad I went and it probably won't be my last time out there. Again, thank you for joining me. Please like and subscribe and comment on whatever your thoughts are regarding this case and we will see you on the next one.